chapter 13. How important it is it? How important is it for we as believers to make sure that righteousness is upheld? Think we could put a, you know, very much or uh, comparative answer to that, could we? We couldn't say it's very important. Well, yeah, it's very important. But is that still understated? How important is it that our righteousness is upheld, particularly among believers? What's of utmost importance? so important that you could say that it's the chief thing among believers. The command to be holy is married to the command to be separate from the world. And as a believer, it's surprising sometimes that those who wish to ally themselves, ally themselves, with the world are oftentimes believers. But what is every bit of surprising is that believers who, because of decisions of others, are allied or yoked up with unbelievers, because they're yoked up with unbelievers because of others' decisions, it's amazing how few believers take issue with that make an issue with it. And that's what we're going to see tonight in our text. We've seen the temple rebuilt. We've seen revival happen among God's people. And we began by saying that if Nehemiah were the only one determined to rebuild the walls and the gates, he would have set about to do the task, to accomplish the task. And I personally believe that it could have been a task which would have been ultimately performed much like Noah's task was. Uh, how many of you have been to the new ark at the Creation Museum in Kentucky? You guys want to go there tomorrow? Sure. Yeah. It's kind of fun, isn't it? Yeah, I keep meaning to stop by there and I haven't had a chance. Uh, I wouldn't mind. I, I heard that they charge exorbitant prices, like actual cash, money, to see it. And I, I really... I've had so many opportunities to go to theme parks and pass it up because they charge money for it, but I'd pay to see something like Noah's Ark. I would be very interested to know the recreation of Noah's Ark. I'd be interested to know what kind of labor was involved, how many different people, how much collaboration in design and in labor was required. Would it be neat if, the, if in Kentucky they had built the Noah's Ark model uh, with you know, a guy and his sons, three sons, building it, four guys building it. That'd be pretty impressive to me. But I suspect that more than four people were involved with the building of the ark, especially if the four guys were responsible for raising the funding and the materials for it as well. But that literally was Noah's scenario. When Noah built the ark, everyone in the world mocked him for it. But he built the ark. God spared just Noah. And I see Nehemiah in many ways as a Noah character in his day with the specific standout difference that when Nehemiah began to set about by faith to determine first to see personal revival but also to build the walls, then those others who were believers got on the bandwagon. And national revival was the result of one man's determination to do right. One man's determination to do right literally triggered national revival. And I want to see that same theme again. We see it over and over again in our text, but we're going to see it again in our text this evening, beginning of verse 1 of chapter 13. Uh, on that day, uh, they read in the book of Moses in the audience of the people, and therein was found written, that the Ammonite and the Moabites should not come into the congregation of God forever, because they met not the children of Israel with bread and with water, 
but hired Balaam against them that he should curse them. Howbeit our God turned the curse into a blessing. Now it came to pass when they had heard them all that they separated from Israel all the mixed multitude. And before this, Eliashib the priest, having the oversight of the chamber of the house of God, was allied unto Tobiah. And we'll pray. Father, please help us as we see the influence of one man, one individual who was determined uh, that he was going to be separated unto you and that he would not overlook unrighteousness among other believers. God, I pray that you'd help us to be determined the same. God, not in a sanctimonious, uh, legalistic way, but in a legitimate striving for holiness. Help us to understand this now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So God's people made a covenant with God. They put their name, they signed it. And they signed the covenant that they were going to keep God's law and that they were going to separate themselves. And they separated the priesthood. And they well, last week we saw what it takes to have revival. They, as a group of people, acknowledged that God's judgment of the captivity for them and the reality that they lived in a land where strangers reaped the uh, fruit of it, they were to blame for it. They acknowledged that the sin was what was what, or that they were to blame for their sin. And in that acknowledgement, they also declared that God was right and righteous to judge them. In other words, God's covenant was, "I'll do this. You'll go into captivity." And so they declared, "God." You've kept your covenant and you were right to judge us. The judgment we've had is right. It's amazing how many believers have consequences from sin and yet refuse to acknowledge that God was right to judge them. Friend, your consequences came from God. And you'll be either you'll either be in a place where you're penitent or you'll be in a place where you're bitter and rebellious against God, depending on how you respond to God's right to judge you. I will say this, God will judge you whether you acknowledge His right to do so or not. The Bible clearly states that the wicked will one day bow. And they will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And the same will be true of every person who is in rebellion against God. My friend, the rebel can stand with a stiff back looking upward into heaven, gazing at God figuratively, if you will. But the fact of the matter is that one day he'll fall on his face because he will not be able to stand before God. You, as a believer, will either come to a place where you humble yourself and you acknowledge God's right, or you will be humbled, one or the other. You know, it's rather tragic, rather tragic and foolish that a created being should have to undergo so much humiliation that is self-inflicted. And a created being should have to undergo uh, so much chastisement that is self-caused simply because he will not acknowledge that the Creator is in his right to judge and that the Creator is in his right to bring him to the place where he bows. See, I have a problem bowing to a man. Don't you? Because a man is a mere created being like myself. I love the constitution of this country, which is unlike any other, that says that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. I love that. All men are created by God and they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights. And I love that in our Constitution. It makes us, this nation uh, distinct from any other. It's why we, uh, as Americans, find ourselves in the situation oftentimes of being world police. Sometimes people say, you know, America needs to stay out of other countries' business. Well, um, I don't like getting anybody's business, but I'll tell you this, people that believe in human rights ought to stand for them. 
how to stand for them. I, I know people that say, you know, the Gulf War cost us way too much and it was all about oil. Well, it may have been all about oil for you, but for me it was about atrocities. It was about human rights. The people in Iraq had suffered things that no one should suffer at the hands of a despot, of a dictator. And it was right for us to interfere and to say no one can be treated that way. You say, Pastor, we need to you know, keep church and religion separated. I'll tell you something. People that believe in human rights ought to allow the atrocities that Islam that Islam forces on all types of people, particularly women. If you care about people being made in the image of God, it ought to bother you. And you ought to say, you know something? It doesn't matter if it's, it is my business. Human rights are my business. And I'm not trying to be political in that this evening. I'm just simply telling you, as a Christian, that's the way we think. And there ought to be any cost. There ought to be any cost that we would forego in order to stand for the rights of somebody. And believers, honestly, shouldn't be concerned about the cost of doing right. Doing right is always costly. Just do right. Let God provide for that. If you do it for the right reason, God will provide. Now, here Nehemiah and the people have had revival. And they said, the summary of the revival in Nehemiah 9.36, Behold, we are servants this day and for the land that thou gavest. Our fathers to eat the fruit thereof and, eat, and the good thereof. Behold, we are servants in it. And it yieldeth much increase unto the kings whom thou hast set over us because of our sins. The reason this land is giving increase to people that you've set over us is because of our sins. It's our fault. They've accepted personal responsibility. In verse 38, Because of this we make a sure covenant and write it, and our princes, Levites, and priests seal unto it. And literally, chapters 10 and chapter 11 and uh, chapter 12 really deal with that covenant that they signed their names to, acknowledging that they were going to follow after God and that they were accepting personal responsibility for the sin of their nation. Essentially, they signed their name to a covenant of revival. And that's where we find ourselves in chapter 13. First of all, we find in chapter 13 that God's people were not set in their ways. Verse 1, they read in the book of Moses in the audience of the people, and therein was found written that the Ammonite and the Moabite should not come into the congregation of God forever, because they met not the children of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them, that he should curse them. You remember that, don't you? The Ammonites hiring Balaam to try to curse Israel. And God turned that on them. God turned the cursing into a blessing for Israel. But the Bible says in verse 3 that when the people learned this about the character of God, they separated from Israel all the mixed multitude. Now the Bible does not say that they separated from the Moabites and the Ammonites. It says they separated from the mixed multitude. And here we find that God's people implemented standards on the basis of the principle behind them. This is not the Moabites and the Ammonites that they're separating themselves from. It's the people who are not for the Lord that they separate themselves from. You know, I think that today the average church that likes to preach worldliness and teach worldliness in the congregation would have a real issue with this principle and this concept. And they would be very, very legalistic about the way that they would apply it. They'd say, didn't say not to separate from everybody, it said just the Ammonites and the Moabites. My friend, can you and I discern from the Word of God that our principles do have biblical authority? It's amazing how many Christians want the specifics so that they only have to do the minimum when really we have a God who wants a heart that's willing to do everything. See, God wasn't concerned with the name Ammonite or Moabite. He was concerned with separation, and God's people recognized that. It's incredible how different it is when people have a heart to please God, isn't it? When people have a heart to please God, it isn't a matter of what are we permitted or what are we disallowed. 
Instead, it's a matter of what pleases God. And that's what we'll do. You know, people sometimes want me to give specifics about things. And I just tell them, you know what? It's just a general principle. I'm not going to give you specifics about it. Sometimes it's dress. Pastor, you know, do ladies, I mean, do ladies have to wear only dresses? No. Well, if they're appropriate dresses, I guess it's a pretty safe place to be. Right? Well, what about modest pants? Well, what about them? What's your concern? What's your concern? I'm not answering. I'm not taking questions right now, Bella. Okay? No. No, not now. Um, what's your concern? Is your concern the principle on the basis of God's character, or is your concern what can I do, and what am I willing to do for God? See, it's, the, the answer to those questions ought to have been settled a long time ago. Anything God wants, that's what I want. You'd be amazed at how believers don't struggle over simple standards when they just take a high standard because we have a God who has high standards. See, you say, Pastor, do you believe that everything has to be exactly like this? No, actually, I don't at all. I don't think we have to define it exactly. I think we just need to have high standards to reflect a God who has high standards. I'm concerned about somebody who wants to know what the definition of the standard is. Because one of the things I know about them is anytime you, you set a definition, they're figuring out a loophole. The more laws you have, the more loopholes you have. And a loophole is trying to get around the principle. Because the principle isn't, I want God to be pleased. And boy, we could, in all kinds of things, apply that, couldn't we? What about music? What kind of music should a Christian listen to? Should a Christian never listen to anything that is non Worship music? I mean, what about silly songs? Are they evil? You know, you know, I, I can't define that for you. We're supposed to be in the world, not of the world. That's the standard. Some Christians want to define it all the way to here, and the reason they define it all the way to here is because they don't mind encroaching on everybody else's desires, but they want to make sure that they avoid theirs because theirs are right here. Some Christians don't think you should sing, Oh, McDonald has a farm. I'm being a little bit silly about it. Oh, McDonald had a farm. I don't think he has it anymore because his animals all talked wrong. It was past tense. Oh, McDonald used to, used to was a farmer. No <laughs> more. You know something? As a believer, our standard's holiness. You know the Holy Spirit kind of helps you with that if you have a heart to do it, to do right, don't you? Doesn't he? kind of helps you. You know, I don't feel very good about things that God's Holy Spirit doesn't feel good about. And that's a hell. And as believers, I think institutionally sometimes you set standards. And Israel as, as a nation set some standards. They separated themselves. You're, you're not a follower of God. You're not part of this congregation. Now listen to me. God's law had a way that you could become part of the congregation. You could become an Israelite. God had a process to become an Israelite. Rahab became an Israelite. Ruth became an Israelite. God had a process for His people to become Israelites. Do you understand that? In other words, it isn't, you can't come in and you're never be allowed. It's, you're not interested in God and therefore we have to be separated. That's the standard. It's amazing how that's a problem. And it'd be a problem in the church today. You'd be surprised, I hope, if you knew that a lot of churches that are, quote, evangelical, that believe the gospel as it's written in the scripture, that preach it, that preach the gospel and they try to and they, and they endeavor uh, to baptize believers and disciple them and carry out the work of God, you'd be surprised how many of them have secular musicians that they pay to perform who are not even born again as part of their worship. <laughs> I have musicians call me all the time asking if we're hiring. 
you'd be you'd be so surprised. You know how many musicians call to ask if we're hiring, and I always ask them the first question. Do you go to our church? I know they don't, but I always ask them that question because I'm trying to make a point, and they don't understand why it's important for them to be of like faith in order to be part of our worship service, because that isn't a standard that they've ever been held to before. I remember uh, when I worked in the mechanic shop, there was a guy I was witnessing to who was not yet saved, but he was becoming interested because. Uh, one of the local churches had recruited him them because he was a professional guitar player, and they recruited him to play, uh, you know, in their worship band. He was lost. You say, Pastor, well, you know, isn't it great that they were evangelizing him? No, it just made him feel like he didn't need to be saved to play in the worship band. There's no separation. That's tragic, actually. And as a believer, we have to separate ourselves. And I'm not talking about going out of the world. I'm talking about in the congregation. We're not talking about in living. Matter of fact, if you see some of the details where they determined that they weren't going to do business with unbelievers on the Sabbath. You'll see that it isn't a matter of doing business with them. It's a matter of we're not going to compromise what we are by bringing in unholy things. Now, look at verse 4. Nehemiah said, Before this, Eliashib the priest, having the oversight of the chamber of the house of our God, was allied unto Tobiah. Now that word oversight would be the Old Testament equivalent of the word uh, that is uh, part of the command for pastors, keeping, taking the oversight thereof. Taking oversight doesn't mean take the cash out of it. Taking oversight means the management of it. You understand that? Oversight means management. And this guy who was... Uh, the, the priest, Eliashib, had the oversight of the chamber of the house of our God, and the Bible says was allied unto Tobiah. Now, do we remember Tobiah? Remember Tobiah? Remember what Tobiah said um, in uh, chapter 4, verse 3? Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, speaking of Sam Ballot, and he said, Even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. And guess who's living inside the stone walls? Tobiah. Guess who wants the protection of the stone walls? Tobiah. Guess who's living in the facility of the temple itself? Tobiah. Now, there are two things that I would note about this. The first thing is, why was Nehemiah the only guy who was shocked about this? Why was Nehemiah the only guy that said, what in the world is that guy doing in this place? What is he doing here? It's the first thing that was shocking to me. Why is that guy here? <laughs> and the second thing that's shocking is why does he want to be there? Why does Tobiah want to be there? Why is he there? And why, or why is nobody questioning his presence? And secondly, uh, why does he want to be there? He was against the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the temple the whole time. Remember, he, he was the opposition. Friends, there is a battle and there are sides. Today, you know, we want to just be so... Uh, we want to use such politically correct vernacular in Christianity that we don't want to acknowledge that there's a battle and that there are sides. There's winning and there's losing. There's a battle. There are sides. There is winning and there is losing. Anyone who goes to hell loses. And anyone who goes to hell sides against God with the Satan. There's a battle, there are sides, there is winning, and there is losing. And the guy on the losing side has allied himself with the priest, Eliashib. And what's shocking about it is that nobody questions it, and what's shocking about it is that <laughs> he wants to be part of it. Now, I don't know the heart 
of Eliashib on the basis of his saying, even if they build a wall, if a fox goes on, it'll fall down. Foxes don't knock too many things down. But I have an idea about his heart. And so I know that when Eliashib allies himself with Tobiah, that I have a good glimpse at the heart of Eliashib, the priest, that he's not walking perfectly with the Lord. So here's Nehemiah's response. Verse 5, uh, or I'm sorry, here's a little more details. He had prepared for Nehemiah a great chamber. Great means large, big. Which aforetime, where aforetime they laid the meat offerings and the frankincense, the frankincense and the vessels and the tithes of the corn and the new wine and the oil, which was commanded to be given to the Levites and the singers and to the porters and the offering of the priests. <laughs> so, he has displaced the support of the priests. In other words, all these things that were given were for the porters and were for the offerings of the priests. So what does that indicate? It indicates that Eliashib has allied himself with somebody who literally has taken his own supply or his own means for sustenance. Afraid of you ally yourself with the world, trust me, they're not going to take care of you. You ally yourself with the world, they'll displace God's provision for you. Surprising to me how many Christians don't think they can trust God, and they think they can trust God's enemies better. And that's Eliashib the priest. Nehemiah has a reason why this has gotten to this stage or this point. The reason was he wasn't there. In verse uh, 6, Nehemiah said, But in all this time was not I at Jerusalem. For in the two and thirtieth year of Artaxerxes king of Babylon came I unto the king, and after certain days obtained I leave of the king. He said, I was gone, I was out of town. And in verse 7, I came to Jerusalem and understood of the evil that Eliashib did for Tobiah in preparing him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. Now notice the way that Nehemiah said this. Nehemiah said that Eliashib was the one responsible for the evil that he did to Tobiah. Did you notice that? The Bible doesn't say, I found out about how evil Tobiah was. He said, I found out the evil that Eliashib did for Tobiah. And my friend, if you're the one who is leading God's people into an allegiance with the world, it isn't the world that's... You know, you say, oh, you know, we've got to love the world. We've got to love the lost. No, it, the, the world, we don't have an issue with that. What we ought to have an issue with is you for an allegiance with the world. Lost people are lost people. I, I'm not bothered by... Very little that lost people do bothers me, to be honest with you. I expect them to be what they are. Um... I'm not offended when a person I know the, <coughs> when a person who's lost swears a cuss. I like how I said that. <laughs> yeah. I'm not offended when a lost person lives immorally. It, it doesn't offend me because it's what's expected of a lost person. What I'm surprised about is Christians who want to ally themselves or get an allegiance with that. I remember some years ago, my wife and I talking to people who knew better. And they were letting me know that they were winning the lost. I remember in an instance, two guys who were working as staff in a church telling us that they were going to win this lost guy, that they were taking fishing with them. And they didn't have a problem, you know, if he brought along his beer and drank beer on their boat. And I sat there thinking, and you don't probably have a problem cracking a uh, bud open and drinking one with them either, probably. I actually believe they probably did. I, you know, I don't have a problem with a lost guy drinking beer. But you know something? I've never had a lost guy need to drink beer on my boat. And he'll still go fishing with me. <laughs> I, I've, I have before had lost people say or do things around me that someone else tells them, you know that? You probably shouldn't do that around the pastor. And they oh, they won't do it. 
because they are you know they have a respect. This guy Tobiah didn't have a respect for holiness. He displaced the supply for God's people and lived in that same chamber. And I guarantee you, it was chuckling and making light of the fact that his living quarters were in the place where the support of God's people should have been. It's tragic. So Nehemiah did what? Well, in verse 9 he said, or 8, he said, It grieved me sore, therefore I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. See, Jesus wasn't the first one to do that. <laughs> Nehemiah said, It grieved me sore. And he is so sore about it, he went and grabbed Tobiah's junk and threw it out. <laughs> I love this guy, Nehemiah. Don't you? Can you imagine all the chattering? Well, how does he think he has the right? Right? I mean, can you imagine all the people that thought that Nehemiah didn't have the right? Well, let me ask you a question. What was Nehemiah's title in the temple? Governor, Governor in the temple? What was his title in the temple? He didn't. He wasn't allowed to have one. You know what happened with guys that tried to take something on themselves with regard to spiritual matters. Remember what happened to Saul when he offered sacrifice? Remember what happened to the fellows that offered strange fire? Nehemiah didn't have a title. And God didn't have the earth open up and swallow him out. Or swallow him up either, did he? You know, most of the time believers say things like, well, it, I don't have the right. And you're actually rather wrong about that. Nehemiah said, he doesn't have the right. And he said, I'm getting him out. Grabbed his stuff and he threw it out. Can you imagine that? I can. You know, we don't have a lot of Nehemiahs today. Guys that say, you know something, they don't have the right to do that with something that belongs to God. And it isn't Nehemiah's right it's about Tobias not having the right. Verse 9, Then I commanded, and they cleansed the chambers. They bleached everything. Used some vinegar, and I think, uh, rubbing alcohol. Then I commanded, they cleansed the chambers, and thither brought I again the vessels of the house of God with the meat offering and the frankincense. Verse 10, I perceived the portions of the Levites. Oh, here we're going to learn something. I perceived that the portions of the Levites had not been given them, for the Levites and the singers that did the work were fled every one to his field. Nehemiah said, incidentally, why wasn't that chamber full of the provisions for the singers and the Levites? Where was the stuff that was supposed to be in the place Tobiah was? And all of a sudden we find the motive of the people to do nothing. Here's the deal. It didn't take a lot to read between the lines here. The elders of the people were happy having Tobiah filling the chambers because that meant they didn't have to fill the chambers with their tithes. <laughs> they were happy to have a man in a place he didn't belong because the stuff that would have been costing them was not there as well. Well, I mean, we don't have any place for the stuff. How can I give it? Provided them with a great excuse to not do their duty. And friend, I'll just say to you, the reason you want worldliness or you allow worldliness in the church is because it provides an excuse for you not to do your duty. Worldliness provides an excuse for you not to do your duty. Think of it. Think of it. You know why Christians don't have a problem with Worshiping God less and less. The average church has one service a week now, one hour a week, that they worship God. And they have a big get together, make a big hoopla, do it big. And you know why Christians are okay with that? Not being fed spiritually, not being challenged spiritually. You know why believers are okay with that? Well, because it doesn't take much from them. They're pretty. They're pretty fine with that. It doesn't demand anything from them. Not to bother you. Not to bother you. 
God's people aren't being fed. But it doesn't bother the average believer that God's people aren't being fed because it saves them from having to invest their time, having to invest their attention, from being challenged to give themselves wholly to the Lord. And so Nehemiah, he said in verse 11, why is the house of God forsaken? He says about the elders of Israel, and I gathered them together and sat them in their place. Verse 12, they brought all Judah the tithe of the corn and the new wine and the oil into the treasuries, and I made treasurers over the treasuries. Shelemiah the priest, and Zadok the scribe, and of the Levites, Pediah. And next to him was Hanan, the son of Zachar, the son of Madaniah, for they were counted faithful, and their office was to distribute unto their brethren. He put faithful men into the leadership. Before, who did we have in leadership? Eliashib. Faithful or unfaithful? Unfaithful. Verse 14. Remember me, O my God, concerning this, and wipe not out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for the offices thereof. That's where we'll end this evening. We end with Nehemiah's prayer. God, please remember Please remember, don't wipe out my good deeds that I've done for the house of my God and for the offices thereof. And I have to say to you, friend, that doing right at the outset seems to be costly, though I will say to you that doing wrong costs more than you can ever afford. Doing right at the outset seems to be very costly. But let's ask the rhetorical question and answer it. You think God remembered Nehemiah and what he'd done? to clean up God's house. It's eternally written. It's eternally written, so God remembers it. And in the whole scheme of things today, how much does that matter? I don't think we could overstate, I don't think we could overstate the importance of how much that matters to you. God remembers. God knows. You know something, I think for a believer that's a motto you could adopt that will help you sometimes. When it seems as though nobody understands or as though the task seems impossible, to just say, God knows. I promise you, Nehemiah was spoken against by, quote, well-meaning people when he threw Tobiah's junk out, when he grabbed the elders and said, you come here and you sit down. He took all 12 of them. He sat him down. He said, why are you not supporting the Levites? Why is this chamber empty? And they said, uh, we'll fill it up. So here again we see one man having the determination that if it's right, then he'll do it. And we see one man affecting an entire nation for righteousness. The question, the question always is, what if one man, what if one woman <coughs> will do right? What will be the effect? First on their lives, and what will be the effect on the lives of those that are around them? There's only one way you can know and that's by being the one who does right no matter the cost. I love that about this thing we've seen in Nehemiah as we've looked at revival. Father, please help us to believe the truth that we've seen by example and by the testimony of Your Word. I pray that You would help us to practice and live our lives on the basis of it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me give you a little update on